I have been asked to say a few words by way of introduction to the film which you are about to witness. The object of this film is to give you a brief but vivid impression of the great conservative statesman of the last century, Benjamin Disraeli, Earl of Beaconsfield. And we have been extremely fortunate in securing for the purpose of presentation the services of that most distinguished actor, Mr. George Arliss, whose name is so well known in connection with that famous play of Disraeli. Now, in the course of this film, I think you will all of you be very much struck by those remarkable qualities of Disraeli, his rhetoric, his force of expression, and his vision. You will hear him in the first scene, which you will see, speak about the privileges we enjoy as having been born in these islands. You will then hear him speak about the empire. You will hear him speak about the principles of conservatism. And you will hear him discuss fiscal matters. And in all these things, I think you will be astonished in this that of all the statesmen of his period, the time of our grandfathers, he is perhaps the only one who can be read today and appreciated as though he was a modern speaking in the times of today. The explanation of that is the remarkable vision and sympathy of the man. And I ask you to remember these things when you watch the representation. The basis of English society is equality. But here let us distinguish. There are two kinds of equality. There is the equality that levels and destroys, and the equality that elevates and creates. It is this last quality that animates the laws of England. The principle of the first equality is that no one should be privileged. The principle of English equality is that everyone should be privileged. Thus, the meanest subject of our king is born to great and important privileges. An Englishman, however humble may be his birth, is born to the noblest of all inheritances, the equality of civil rights. He is born to freedom, he is born to justice, he is born to property. There is no station to which he may not aspire. There is no master whom he is obliged to serve. There is no magistrate who dares imprison him against the law and the soil on which he labors must supply him with an honest and decorous maintenance. These are rights and privileges as valuable as king, lords, and commons. And it is only a nation thus schooled and cradled in the principles and practice of freedom which indeed could maintain such institutions. You are now going to hear a passage from a speech made by Disraeli at the Crystal Palace in 1872, one of the most famous of all Disraeli's speeches. And the Tory party has three great objects. The first is to maintain the institutions of the country not from any sentiment of political superstition, but because we believe 
They embody the principles upon which a community like England can alone safely rest. The principles of liberty, of order, of law, and of religion ought not to be entrusted to individual opinion or to the caprice and passion of multitudes, but should be embodied in a form of permanence and power. The second great object is, in my opinion, to uphold the empire of England. And the third is to elevate the condition of the people. Let us see, in this great struggle between Toryism and liberalism that has prevailed in this country for the past 40 years, what are the salient features? It must be obvious to all who consider the condition of the people with a desire to elevate and improve it, that no important step can be reached unless you can effect a reduction of the hours of labor and humanize their toil. That, the great problem, is to be able to achieve these results without violating those principles of economic truth upon which the prosperity of all states depends. Gentlemen, the Tory party, unless it is a national party, is nothing. It is not a confederacy of nobles. It is not a democratic multitude. It is a party formed from all the numerous classes of the realm, classes alike and equal before the law, but with different conditions and different aims which give vigor and variety to our national life. You are now going to hear a passage from a speech made by Disraeli at the Crystal Palace in 1872. One of the most famous of all Disraeli's speeches. And the Tory party has three great objects. The first is to maintain the institutions of the country. Not from any sentiment of political superstition, but because we believe they embody the principles upon which a community like England can alone safely rest. The principles of liberty, of order, of law, and of religion ought not to be entrusted to individual opinion or to the caprice and passion of multitudes, but should be embodied in a form of permanence and power. The second great object is, in my opinion, to uphold the empire of England. And the third is to elevate the condition of the people. Let us see, in this great struggle between Toryism and liberalism that has prevailed in this country for the past 40 years, what are the salient features? It must be obvious to all who consider the condition of the people with a desire to elevate and improve it, that no important step can be reached unless you can effect a reduction of the hours of labor and humanize their toil. That, the great problem, is to be able to achieve these results without violating those principles of economic truth upon which the prosperity of all states depends. Gentlemen, the Tory party unless it is a national party, is nothing. It is not a confederacy of nobles. It is not a democratic multitude. It is a party formed from all the numerous classes of the realm, classes alike and equal before the law, but with different conditions and different aims which give vigor and variety to our national life. a representation of this really addressing the upper house on the subject of the British Empire at the House of Lords in 1878. I have ever considered 
that Her Majesty's government, of whatever party form, are the trustees of the empire. That empire was formed by the enterprise and energy of your ancestors, my lords, and it is one of a very peculiar character. I know no example of it, either in ancient or modern history. No Caesar or Charlemagne ever presided over a dominion so peculiar. Its flag floats on many waters. It has provinces in every zone. They are inhabited by persons of different races, different religions, different laws, manners, customs. Some of these are bound to us by ties of liberty, fully conscious that without their connection with the metropolis, they have no security for public freedom and self-government. Others are bound to us by flesh and blood and by material as well as moral considerations. My lords, that empire is no mean heritage. That it is not a heritage that can only be enjoyed, it must be maintained and it can only be maintained by the same qualities that created it. By courage, by discipline, by patience, by determination, and by our reverence for public law and respect for national rights. I cannot conceive how our distant colonies can have their affairs administered except by self-government. But self-government, in my opinion, when it was conceded, ought to have been conceded as part of a great policy of imperial consolidation. It ought to have been accompanied by an imperial tariff. It ought further to have been accompanied by the institution of some representative council in the metropolis, which would have brought the colonies into constant and continuous relations with the home government. All this, however, was omitted uh, because those who advised that policy, and I believe their convictions were sincere, I looked upon the colonies of England, looked even upon our connection with India as a burden on this country, viewing everything in a financial aspect and totally passing by those moral and political considerations which make nations great, and by the influence of which alone men are distinguished from animals. You will now hear Disraeli delivering a passage from a speech which he made at Shrewsbury, which is all the more striking when it is remembered that this speech was delivered almost 90 years ago. I still believe there is but one way to extricate this country from the calamities which it now experiences and those which are impending. And that is, by a frank adoption of the principle of reciprocity as the fundamental principle of your commercial code. And that such is the only way, the only means to pursue against hostile tariffs and countervailing duties. To tax the community for the advantage of a class is not protection, it's plunder. And I disclaim it. And I ask you, to protect the rights and interests of labor generally, in the first place, by allowing no free imports from those countries which meet you with countervailing duties, and in the second, with respect to agricultural produce, to compensate the soil for those burdens from which other classes are free by an equivalent duty. That is my view of what is known as protection. I am not an enemy myself 
to free trade, according to my idea of free trade. But my idea of free trade is this. You cannot have free trade unless the person you deal with is as liberal as yourself. If I saw a prize fighter encountering a galley slave in irons, I should consider the combat equally as fair as to make England fight hostile tariffs with free imports. <laughs>